comes to us from Portland. His name is Paul Clock, and I had never met Paul Clock, but he telephoned me and asked if he could come and speak to this group about the building of the Tillamook Railroad. And I checked it out with Shirley, because I usually check things like that out with Shirley if I'm not sure, and she said, certainly, go ahead. Well, you know, of course, never having seen him, I was expecting this elderly gentleman to come tottering in here. So may I introduce Paul Clock, who certainly is not the elderly gentleman I expected. Who, <laughs> who, was, who was here with his wife to tell us a very engrossing story. And furthermore, in my chat with her just as we were eating, I found out it does have some connection with Yamhill County too. So we're home free. Thanks, Barbara. I bailed him out. <laughs> We do everything together, you can tell. <laughs> um, I just want to thank Barbara and the, the uh, Yamhill County Historical Society for having us. Um, she said that she expected somebody old and tottering. Well, I don't know about the old, but I, I do have a tendency to totter. <laughs> um, I'll give a little background about myself and and how I got interested in the railroad. Uh, I grew up in Forest Grove and uh, went through the public schools. And my dad, as, as a child, he used to take me steelhead fishing on the Oregon coast and fish some of the streams that emptied into Tillamook Bay, like the Wilson River and the Trask River. And uh, a lot of good memories that uh, remained in my head. And, and when I got into college at Pacific, Instead of studying, I tell people I would go down and, and fish on the Salmonberry River. The Salmonberry drains into the Nehalem River, which drains into the Tillamook, uh, Nehalem Bay. And um, it was along the Salmonberry, uh, you, ha you have to walk up the railroad in, in order to access the Salmonberry Canyon. And you cross over numerous t uh, trestles and bridges and, and walk through tunnels, and I just wondered, uh, how did this all come about? It must have taken a tremendous amount of manpower and energy and money to build a railroad over the coast range. And so one of the first books I came across was The Tillamook Burn Country, and some of you probably recognize that book by Ellis Lucia. He just passed away not too long ago. But um, and then I started going to museums, um, Barbara Doyle. She was a, a big help. Um, actually, she came along after I had done research, but uh, in the printing process, she was a big help. Washington County Museum was. Um, I visited the Yamhill County Museum. Um, Ruth Stoller was uh, there at that time, and she was very friendly and a, and a big help. And uh, losing track where I'm going. I, so I got interested in the railroad. I did get my teaching certificate at, at Pacific, and I uh, was commercial fishing in Alaska in the spring and summers for nine years. And that's where I met my wife, Elizabeth. And, uh, and I'm really from Portland. <laughs> <laughs> I just lived up there for six years. Anyway, I decided I needed to get a real job if I was going to pursue this relationship. And so I, I was able to get a job at Nia County School District, which just happened to be close to where the railroad ran. And, and I taught for four years, and then I developed some health problems that I had to give up teaching. And those, that was what I found out was that I had mercury poisoning, and that mercury settles in your central nervous system and your kidneys and does all kinds of things. Um, so that was kind of a setback, but 
I guess the, the positive out of that is I, my wife encouraged me to, um, since I had all this information and photographs, encouraged me to self-publish and bring this work to fruition. And so the book that is over there is uh, kind of a nine-year hobby and efforts that turned into a publication. And all the pictures you're going to see tonight are pictures that didn't make it in the book. Um, one of the reasons I self-published is because I was very impressed with the quality and the, the detail that were in a lot of those old photographs. A lot of them were taken with you know, glass plates and large negatives. And um, so if you get a chance afterwards, you might wander over there and take a look. Um, I probably missed things, but if there's no questions, we'll get on with the slide. Elizabeth's going to talk about some of the excursion runs they have. Um, they started about a year and a half ago at the end of the program. Okay, we'll fine tune the, if we get, get the lights, we'll fine tune the. In the book, I talk about a lot of the towns and communities that sprang up along the railroad as it pushed its way across the coast range. But this series of photographs more or less just deals with the construction of the railroad. There's a few others. And uh, this is a picture showing some of the old growth timber that uh, back prior to the turn of the 20th century and, and following existed between uh, the coast and the Willamette Valley from the Columbia River as far south as Nestucca Drainage. It was, for the most part, an old growth forest. Many of the trees as old as 400 years. There's another picture showing some of the old growth in the Tillamook, Washington, and Yamhill County. There had been a number of railroads that had proposed tapping this timber and connecting with points on the coast. But it wasn't until 1905 that a railroad was actually, actual construction began and worked, was working its way toward Tillamook. Um, there were a few settlements in the big woods. This is an example of what you might find back at the turn of the century. Um, you see a log cabin and some men on horses. Um, back in 1862, the government, they had the, the Homestead Act, which allowed somebody to acquire 160 acres if they would prove up on their claim. In other words, they had to uh, build a small cabin and make some improvements, plant a garden. I think they had to pay a fee of about $10. And if they were able to make go of it for five years, the land was theirs free and clear. This is a picture of Tillamook about 1910. The railroad that I'm going to talk about today is, was began in 1905 and completed in 1911. So this is just before the railroad was completed. So you can see there was pretty good population at Tillamook. And the, the way they had uh, arrived at Tillamook in those days was either by stagecoach or they could take a steamship down the Columbia at Astoria catch an even smaller vessel that would be able to negotiate over the shallow bars, either Tillamook or Nehalem Bay. The earliest stage road that I'm aware of was built out of Yamhill. And prior to 1908, it was called North Yamhill. And I'm, my history of Yamhill area and Yamhill County is, is fairly limited, so uh, some of you might be able to help me out. I think this was called a Trollinger General Merchandise. Is that? Yeah, it's 100 years old. 100 years, wow. Anyway, this is the stage. It was called the Trask River Wagon Toll Road. And uh, it was a 45 mile trip from North Yam Hill uh, up through Ferdale, Fairdale and over Trask Mountain and it came out down on the Trask River. 
there was a couple different options. You could take the Southern Pacific train from Portland, head west through Beaverton, Hillsboro, skirt Forest Grove, and then drop south. Uh, the train actually came, I don't know, three quarters of a mile within town of Yam Hill, North Yam Hill, and then you could catch a hack and stay overnight at the Hotel Royal. And the next morning, catch the stage over to the coast. This was a pretty fancy building, I understand, for that time period. If your, if your departure was later in the day, you might end up staying overnight at the Summit House. And not much for luxur luxury, but a place to uh, rest your weary body and, and uh, water your horses. There was a spring nearby. And, um, Eleanor Mitchell and the Mitchells and were very helpful in tracking down some of the history on the stage route. Over the summit, over the divide and, and down the Trask River, this was the Trask House and it had been built in the 1870s and owned and operated by several people. This was 16 miles east of Tillamook and uh, this picture was taken sometime uh, probably between 19... 1901 and 1906, and the Gober family operated it at that time, and according to Frank Gober, uh, his mother would send him up in the tower so that he could keep a lookout for the stage coming over the hill and relay that she could put on the food. The Trask River Wagon Toll Road was the first road, the second road to the coast North Oregon coast was through Sheridan, the Sheridan route. Uh, that was completed in 1882, so 10 years after the, the Trask, Trask route. And uh, most of the maintenance for these early roads was left to the pioneers who lived along the way. And a third road was completed, a more direct link uh, from Forest Grove through Gales Creek over the divide down the Wilson River to Tillamook. And this is a group of pioneers near, near Gales Creek area. And you can see there, looks like they're uh, plowing and then they'd come behind with these scraping uh, devices. This was a wheeled scraper, basically an iron box mounted on uh, wheels with a blade at the bottom, a long handle. And after that was earth was plowed up, they'd come along and scoop up the ground and then dump it at a handy fill or dumping place. This was the McNamer stage. John and Theo McNamer operated a stage service between Forest Grove and Tillamook. They had livery stables in both locations. And uh, John's son, Fred, is, is uh, driving the stage here. This is Gales Creek, about the turn of the century. There's a blacksmith shop here. And Highway 8 from Forest Grove would uh, continue on past Glenwood and up the Gales Creek drainage and then over the divide. But in those days, they made a sharp left and went up over the hill and came down the south fork of the Wilson. So it's a little different than we drive today. This is a picture of Tillamook. It's a 56 mile trip from Forest Grove. Um, so it wasn't. Uh, at least as far as if you're calculating the, the miles from Portland, the Trask route was a shorter distance. Um, or actually, if you were calculating from Portland, it was probably longer because you had to go farther by train. Um, this shows Tillamook before the streets were paved. It says 1911 on the postcard down there. It wasn't too many years after this that they paved the streets. This is a map showing the area got the Trask River Wagon Toll Road here, or you could go by Southern Pacific Train to Sheridan and take the uh, Big Nestucca Toll Road up to Tillamook, or finally Runyon's Wilson River Road. Runyon was a financer for that toll road. And they, they charged toll. Uh, there was a number of companies that had made a stab at, at maintaining the roads. But like I said earlier, the, a lot of the maintenance was left to the people that had to use it and, and lived along the roads. 
other routes to the Tillamook area. You could take the, the, a boat, or you could go on the Astoria and Columbia River Railroad all the way down to Seaside and then hike over Neocony Mountain, <coughs> Neocony Trail. <coughs> it wasn't until 1905 that a man by the name of Elmer Elm Lytle, who had built a railroad in north central Oregon from Biggs Junction to Shanico. Um, of course, you may have heard of the Lewis and Clark Centennial Exposition in Portland in 1905. It was at that time that he, uh, Lytle had sold off his earlier uh, railroad, the Columbia Southern, and was looking for new railroad opportunities and had taken several trips to Tillamook in finding the country loaded with natural resources, uh, daring and fisheries, but primarily the, the timber, he decided to build a railroad. It was incorporated on October 13, 1905, and this is some of the trees. This tree, I, I believe, was up near Cochrane, uh, the summit of the railroad, where the railroad went over the summit. Uh, elevation about 1,835 feet. One of the first obstacles Elmer Lytle and his brother Charles, who worked with him, was to find the best route for their railroad. Unlike building a railroad through prairie land where you could see everything, there was a lot of uh, canyons and, and they had to build a lot of tunnels. And they'd send dozens of surveying crews out into the field to gather the information. This particular surveyor, his name was G.B. Nunn, Gilman Barry Nunn, and I came across a number of articles that he wrote in later life in the 50s, chronicling or telling about what it was like working for the railroad. These surveyors would bring their, their data back, and this is one of the railroad survey plats just west of the summit. And you can see the railroad uh, line here, and this is the Salmonberry River. Uh, just to the north of it, and rather than crossing this feeder stream, Wolf Creek, they decided to build up Wolf Creek. They had to go through a tunnel over a high wooden bridge and back down the other side of Wolf Creek, hitting the Salmonberry and continuing west. So there was a, there was a lot of uh, obstacles that they had to overcome building this railroad. They began construction from Hillsboro in 1905. And camps were set, out, set up out in the woods. This is a camp just above Timber, Oregon, which is upper Nehalem, the headwaters of the Nehalem. You can see it's fairly primitive, but they had to be out there for weeks, months, and sometimes years in the field. Roads had to be built to provide access for crews and supplies. You can see a road going through the big trees Crews had to be sent out to clear the right of way. Once they established their line, their railroad uh, uh, location, uh, crews would have to clear 100 feet in width. That was the proposed uh, right of way. And many of these trees were six and eight feet in diameter and take anywhere from, uh, generally, I think, from what I've heard, two to four hours to cut a tree this size. This is a shot of some of the trees stacked over one another on the right of way. This is some of the faller following the crew, hamming it up for the photographer. You can see a steam donkey over there to the right. It says uh, eight feet, ten inches in diameter. This is that same steam donkey, a closer view, and you notice uh, there's some big wood or logs, timbers here, and they're uh, tapered at the end, and there's no wheels. And they, it was a steam-powered uh, piece of machinery, steam winches. They'd hook cable on around a tree or a stump and it'd be, just pull themselves along. Uh, or they could, using blocks and tackle, they could pull logs at different angles and clean, clean up the right-of-way. Other crews were sent out to build culverts. This is a hand-hewn culvert. You can see the, the broad axe marks on that timber. These guys are 
looks like they're hoisting a timber with some PVs. <coughs> a lot of the local farmers were employed in, in grading the railroad. Again, these are terms that I've heard, slips and wheelers. The slips or Fresnos, they didn't have the wheels. And uh, you see that device here, it basically just slid along the ground and they could control whether it was digging or, or not, the long handle. This is a shot so showing some of the grade work uh, with wheelers. They may be scraping up here, and then they'd bring the, the earth and dump it to create this uh, more con constant uh, grade, or level, fairly level grade. The railroad had to be fairly consistent couldn't be up and down like many of the logging, rail, logging roads we have today. Uh, this is a picture of banks. The railroad, uh, the rails were laid through banks in 1906. This picture is 1910, but you can still look up this road today and see a lot of these houses, same houses there. By August of 1906, the rails had reached Buxton, a tiny community on the fringe of the mountains. And it was that same year, on October 27th, 1906, that groundbreaking, they had groundbreaking ceremonies at Tillamook. And over about 800 people gathered to watch this long look for event. Steamers and pile drivers had to be brought over to the coast by barge to prosecute the work along the, the coast side. Logs had to be removed from the right of way. And most all the equipment, uh, the first locomotive was and equipment were brought to Bay City. This is a picture of Bay City. They had a dock already uh, jetting out into the bay, and that's where they unloaded the first engine. This was the engine brought over the Tillamook side. It was a wood-burning wood engine, had a diamond stack there. And This is Elmer Lytle, the president and promoter, his brother Charles, and possibly some businessmen and other railroad officials. From Bay City, they uh, laid the rails north and south. So this is south toward Tillamook and a bridge crossing over the Wilson River. These were through how truss bridges utilized uh, horizontal and diagonal wooden members and vertical iron tension members. And this is a design that went back as far as the Civil War. But in most cases in the Willamette Valley, they were using iron steel at this time for their uh, through how trust bridges but because of the vast quantities of large timber on the coast they used the wooden variety by 1908 the rails had reached about halfway between Buxton and Timber and on the coast had reached Hobsonville where a work on a 300 foot tunnel was underway this is that tunnel at Hobsonville you can see some wooden carts on temporary track where they would load the carts and pull the debris away with horses or mules. This is Tunnel 1 on the, the Hillsboro Division. It had two divisions, the uh, Tillamook Division and the Hillsboro Division. This tunnel was the longest on the line, about 1,435 uh, feet in length. And you can see a guy up there. He doesn't want any part of that kind of work. <laughs> but the tunnels were bored using a method uh, hand drilling. And basically, an iron rod with a chisel-like tip it could either be <coughs> processed or gone about with one guy <coughs> operating, holding the chisel rod and a, and a sledge, or two men, possibly even more than that, but one guy holding the rod and the other pounding away. And every after every hit, he might turn the chisel, the rod, drilling bar just a little bit, and that's how they. They drill their holes and set their charges of dynamite and then sh shoot it. This was a possibly a dynamite shanty there on the right. There were <clears throat> over 60 bridges on this railroad, um, 35 over 100 feet in length. And you can see a pile driver here and some of the leveling equipment, level rod. This is a completed shot of one of the bridges between Buxton and Timber. This is a bridge uh, 
You can see that the pile driver here, this is the hammer of the pile driver, and uh, the hammer would be hoisted with the steam engine back here and then released, and it would come and drive the butt into the piling, the log, it'd, it'd uh, drive the piling anywhere from six to 10 feet was the typical depth they would drive those. And each bent, a bent was a cross section. In this case, there were five piles to a bent and 15 feet between each bent. This is that same bridge completed. This is the other end of that tunnel number one. And by 1909, the rails had about reached Timber, Oregon and on the coast side had reached the Miami River. And it was at this point that the largest uh, bid for work was let out to John W. Sweeney. And he had the contract, the railroad had given him the contract to, to build the, the most, uh, through the heart of the coast range, the, the backbone more or less, the most difficult portion um, over and down the Salmonberry River and, and proceeding down the Nehalem River. Sweeney would bring his materials by rail to the end of the rail and then load, load his supplies onto horses and wagons and, and take those items out to the different uh, job sites along his contracted distance. This was Timber, Oregon. There wasn't much at Timber, and there's still not much at Timber. Um, I can say that maybe because I'm down here now. <laughs> but. Um, this was a timber post office that had been established in 1901. The man that operated it, uh, one of the ways he made money was to manufacture decoy ducks, and he sold those all over the Northwest. This is some logs being loaded, possibly from the right of way onto flat cars at timber. And you can see the makings, uh, beginnings of some buildings. As soon as the rails were laid through timber, there were uh, saloons and restaurants and all kinds of buildings that sprang up and a, and a mill close by. There's another shot of Timber, Oregon. That uh, post office was down in the flat over here. Sweeney had to continue and build roads to access the right-of-way. A telegraph line was installed from Hillsborough to the front of the construction so he could relay for whatever he needed. This is one of the construction camps along the way. And here's the, the timber post office in the wintertime. Of course, in the wintertime, the snows didn't, well, it did hamper the construction, but it didn't cause them to quit altogether. Uh, when they had snows, they could continue to work on bridges and in the tunnels. But because of the high saturation of the earth, it was pretty hard to do any grading during the winter time. So they did most of their work was on the bridges and tunnels. <coughs> this is one of the bridges beyond timber. You can see some of the workers up at the very top of the pile driver. I don't think I'd venture up that high, but this was the Step Creek Bridge, and at the time it was built, it was reputed, reputed to be the highest single pile trestle in the world. Uh, the piles were about 130 feet in length, and that was to allow for the cutoff at the top and, and the penetration into the ground, and the height of the bridge was 104 feet from the water up to the rail. Steam shovels could work from the ends of the track, this was a Marion shovel, model number 40. It says J.W. Sweeney Construction Company there. It took several men to operate one of these beasts, but it sure beat the pick and shovel method. This was the headquarters camp, and this is where all the laborers were paid. Um, many of the laborers were from uh, Eastern or European immigrants, a lot of uh, Italians and, and Greeks, um, Austrian. Uh, there was even, actually one of the articles I read said that between 1907 and 1910, over 40% uh, of the railroad workers in Oregon were Japanese. So what we think of when they built the Transcontinental Railroad, where they used a lot of Chinese, the Chinese were excluded. There was an act, uh, 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act, that uh, 
eliminated railroads from being able to hire the Chinese. And so they would, whoever would work for the seemingly low wages, that's who they'd, they'd hire. This is that same location in the snow, almost buried. Some of the living quarters looks really cold. A couple of rail cars, flat cars with rail on them, almost buried. Some more camp life. According to G.V. Nunn, the, the surveyor I mentioned, there was a doctor on the line, Dr. Buckley, and he had the job of moving to and from camp, checking on the workers. Uh, it was reported that there was a workers that would have abscessed tooth, and he was a fairly big man, and he had cock boots on, and it was, I guess, his, his uh, I don't know what, ritual, to step on their foot, foot with his cock boots to take their mind off their tooth and <laughs> yank it out. Unfortunately, GB says that uh, they accused him of pulling the wrong tooth in too many cases. PR and N Company had three locomotives. This is number one. And this is a, uh, a boom or a derrick to the right. Had a boom on it for lifting timbers into place on the building of the bridges. Looks almost buried at this, this shot. And one of the, th because of the, you know, this, my story goes back so far, it was hard to find anybody that was alive at that time people I did talk to that were in their 80s were just kids and so I relied a lot on the newspapers of the time and if somebody came through town back in those days with a mule they wrote about it so it was amazing how much information I found about the construction of the railroad and one article said that either side of the summit about a mile either side they had to shovel the snow which was five feet deep they had to shovel it clear so that they could lay the ties and rails. And so imagine just to lay the ties because of the elements was an obstacle. Some more work in the snow on one of the bridges that they were building. I'm going through these pretty fast, but here's some of the bridge work underway. A derrick with a boom on it. This man looks like he's suspended from the... And I don't think he has a hard hat on, so I don't know what OSHA would think of that. This is that the headquarters camp, a different angle. And the headquarters camp was near the site of Heidel Creek Bridge. And Heidel Creek was named after uh, Frederick M. Heidel, who was a prominent citizen in Hillsboro and owned some timber in the vicinity. This was a multi-storied bridge. See, the lower story was made of piling, and the upper, the three stories above were frame timbers. So each of these posts in this bent were 12 by 12 inch uh, timbers. This bridge is another shot of the same bridge. When completed, it was 154 feet high and about 590 feet long. <coughs> On the Tillamook Division, the rails continue to creep north up the coastline. This is a shot near Lake Lytle. It was named after president and promoter Elmer Elm Lytle. And this is the steam tug George R. Vosberg. This was the vessel that pulled a, a barge with most of the railroad equipment to the, the bay side, the Tillamook side. This was a common occurrence in those days. Before the jetties were built, the vessel would run aground on the spit. And you can see these guys, possibly a line running out to another vessel. And indeed, they were able to pull it off at high tide. Um, this is a Sweeney's camp on the Tillamook side along the Nehalem River. The suspension bridge there to get across. Some more workers in one of the cuts along the Nehalem River. Here's a close-up of that same type of work. A horse would pull the carts as soon as they're loaded to a place to dump. And a lot of times they would just reinforce the grade by dump, uh, dumping the debris over the side there. This is the railroad grade 
proceeding up the Nehalem River. And just a similar shot. And the locomotive with number two with a couple of flat cars and ties and a tie crew putting in the railroad. It's that venerable locomotive that it had been built in 1872 and it's fairly old by the time this photo was taken. The railroad proceeded up the Nehalem and then when it reached where the Salmonberry dumps in, they had to cross over the Nehalem so they could proceed up the Salmonberry. And this was before the bridge, the railroad bridge was put in, this is how the workers would get up the Salmonberry to their camps. And eventually the railroad bridge was put in. That suspension bridge was upstream just a little bit. The Nehalem came in underneath and you see the Salmonberry coming here. You'll notice looks like uh, fires have raged through the area. Back in the newspapers, it was common to come across an article where the construction cookhouse would catch fire and burn up the hillside. So a lot of the timber they were trying to access, they did a number on themselves. This was that bridge over the Nehalem. You can see the stone, the riprap, was tightly packed, hand-packed in there to serve as a breakwater. These were wooden abutments. In later years, they repra replaced these bridges with steel spans about 10 years later. This is the railroad grade ready for the next phase uh, along the Salmonberry. Salmonberry is a premier steelhead, native steelhead stream today. This is one of the cuts uh, under being worked on for the railroad, temporary track, construction camp along the Salmonberry. And the Salmonberry was crossed nine different places. And to provide for a temporary crossing, they'd dri drive the piling uh, into the stream bed and uh, build over the top of that. And then later, put the, after the railroad was completed, they'd come back and, and put in their truss bridges like this. This is a bridge just below Enright, which is one of the kind of intermediate points along the railroad. This is uh, some of the railroad grade, the upper stretches of the Salmonberry. One of the many tunnels, there were 13 tunnels on the line. Most of them were fairly short. This one looks like it's ready for ties and rails. This is uh, one of the rock cuts through the mountains. A lot of blasting and handwork, and sweat and blisters and sore bodies, I can imagine. There's picks and shovels there, and I don't know whether this is a tunnel heading they're about ready to work on or a, just a rock cut. This might be a tunnel here. I notice there's a man up suspended up there, maybe setting charges. I'm not sure. The railroad the temporary track is they are building up the grade through the old growth trees. As you walk through the woods today, our second growth forest, you know, after the Tillamook burn fires, you know, it's getting subs there's some substantial heights to the trees. They're, many of them are 60, 70, 60 years old, but you can still see a lot of these giant uh, stumps. Um, scattered throughout the woods. It's pretty, pretty neat. This is, you can see a tunnel in the background here, and this was called the, the bridge camp, because we're closing in on the highest, the largest bridge on the line. And here's some guys that just wanted to show their excitement for what they're doing. <laughs> and in the newspapers that talked about there were dogs in all the camps. Maybe that was because it was so, such a lonesome lifestyle. Occasional lady might come through camp. Guy taking a breather on one of the flat cars is a boom on that flat car. This, as we mentioned, this railroad still exists. 
and there's uh, this was called Twin Bridges. The two small timber bridges still are still there today. If you, if you were riding the excursion, some guys working at this same site. And they're putting ties in near that same site. This last set of pictures uh, kind of is a sequence on the building of the big Baldwin Bridge. You have this is a fuzzy picture, but you have Baldwin Creek coming through here, and you go through a cut right here. The railroad goes through a cut, and then it's going to span this canyon. And the next picture you'll see is some guys down on the side of the canyon. You can see the water in the bottom of Baldwin Creek there, and what they're doing is it appears they're doing is digging out an area. You'll see in this next picture where they're at on the side of the canyon. They're right here. You see the fresh earth. There's the railroad cut. The train or the, the bridge will begin there and cross this big canyon. And they're, gonna, they're gonna build a platform at that dugout point. And there's the platform. And then they'll bring a they're going to bring a pile driver down and position it on the platform and from that point they can start driving that lower story, the piling for the lower story of the bridge. Here comes the pile driver down the slope. There's another shot of the same thing. It's coming down toward that platform. And of course these steam donkeys and pile drivers and the locomotives, they were all burning wood so you had guys out <coughs> stacking up cordwood for fuel in the woods. This is just a similar shot of what we saw. And here it looks like a couple stories underway and the pile driver out there. Now, here we have two pile drivers, different stories. And they had cables that uh, span the canyon and and they had drop lines. You can see a cable and a drop line, and they could raise and lower uh, timbers into place. You had a lot of timbers that were needed to tie this all together. Diagonal, uh, horizontal, diagonal, cross bracing, and longitudinal girts. And these were all uh, using big iron bolts, and washers, and nuts. They were all tied together. Another shot of the construction, and you see the drop line with the timber. This shot is interesting to me in that you can see that there's nine piles to this bent, this cross section, and these piles are on uh, an angle, or a, called a batter pile, and the five in the middle are vertical, and uh, they would drive these in and then cut off the tops or the butt, butt ends, the big end, they drive the small end of the tree into the ground and then they would put a cap on top of that. And, and these, these upper stories were five piles or five posts if it was a, a framed bent. Oh, can't really see it too much here but I backed up one. This um, pile driver has like a crescent here where the whole driving apparatus could swing to the right or to the right or the left, and that's how they would be able to drive at angles. This was uh, nearing the completion, the upper story, the top story, and you can see these are all the frame timbers. They've been assembled and kind of stacked into position so that they could raise them upright and secure them into place. And there's another shot showing the framed bents. This might be a picture showing, you can see the frame bents here and they might be getting ready to raise one up into place. And they, my understanding is that they use a combination of steam power and horsepower in raising the bents up. I'm not sure if the horses were more control, because uh, of course those those framed bents were very heavy, and so you had to have uh, have it under control, otherwise it'd crash. And I've read several cases of that happening. And finally, 
the tallest bridge at 167 feet high and, and 520 feet long, so not quite as long as that earlier Heidel Creek Bridge, but the highest one, it was estimated to contain over a million board feet of timber. And when the railroad was built, these early bridges like this used untreated timbers, no creosote. And so their expected lifespan was only 10 to 15 years. So the idea was that they would get the railroad up and running so that uh, they could you know, use the railroad, make a profit, and then come back after the lifespan of the timber and replace it with a steel bridge. And in fact, this one was replaced in 1924 with a steel bridge, which remains today. So what began in Hillsboro and a year later in Tillamook in 1911 was completed with daily passenger and, and freight trains running. The passenger service continued all the way up to 1933. Uh, so for a couple decades, they, it was a primary thoroughfare for getting to the coast. And it, the time was about six hours um, from Hillsboro to Tillamook by train. So that definitely a shorter and more comfortable ride than by stage. Um, and here you've got a passenger train going over the big Baldwin Bridge. Well, that's my story. And um, it was a lot of fun interviewing the longtime families of the area and, and hearing what they had to say about their uncles and grandpas that worked on the railroad and seeing their photo albums. And it's been great meeting so many neat people. Thank you. Yes, the, the Pacific Railway and Navigation Company was uh, built from 1905 to 11, and then four years later, in 1915, it was taken over by the Southern Pacific System, Southern Pacific Company, and they operated it until about 1987, when through, my understanding is through lottery monies, or state monies, uh, it was purchased and uh, now it's operated by the Port of Tillamook Bay, Port of Tillamook Bay Railroad. And so I forgot what your question was. Well, is it for logging or is it for They haul passengers? mostly for hauling lumber from the mills in Tillamook. And I think there's a mill in Garibaldi that occasionally uses it. And then they sometimes haul feedstuffs back to the dairymen in Tillamook County and some items for the creamery. and. And um, my wife's got a bit about the excursions they just started running over this line. You probably mentioned this, but uh, also when the railroad was open, I mean, I'd much rather ride the train in six, seven, eight hours than ride a stagecoach over to Tillamook. It would take two days, wouldn't you? So from what he researched, it was a big thing when that railroad opened. Uh, finally, you could ride it. Uh, in the back of, of his book, there's a neat little story, a uh, personal account by a lady named Margaret Watt Edwards. Uh, she just passed away a couple years ago at about age 94. But she rode to the coast from Portland uh, in 1914 with her family, and the story in the back talks about how she got on the train in Portland at the East Morrison Street Depot and rode all the way down to Rockaway. Kind of a neat little ending to the book. Uh, just a couple little commercials here. First of all, um, the exciting thing about this railroad is the fact that it's still alive. It's not been pulled up and abandoned like a lot of short lines around the area. You can actually go and ride an excursion on it. And I think there's a few of you in here that maybe have already ridden the train. Uh, they have been running excursions for quite a few years since regular passenger service stopped back in the 30s. Uh, but there's been times when it hasn't run for a number of years. Uh, they started running some passenger excursions uh, summer of 2001, and they hadn't been able to run since about 95 or so before that. Uh, but they've, been, they've done some real upgrading on the tracks in the last uh, year or so, 
and I've been riding the excursion trains and doing some narration for them on the trip, showing people the old photos that are in Paul's book as we pass these points along the way, and it's kind of interesting to see what's there today or what's not there today and what it used to look like. And over on the table over here, I have a few brochures that you can pick up if you'd like. There's two trips, or two options. Uh, the Port of Tillamook Bay, like Paul said, owns the railroad, and they do run their own excursions uh, from the coast end of the line. You have to go down to Garibaldi or Wheeler as such to get on the train. And they will run those starting uh, this summer, again, just along the coast, and then in the fall they'll run up into the Salmonberry Canyon up to the summit at Cochrane uh, in September and October. But uh, good news is you can ride the whole line starting April 5th with Pacific Sunset. Uh, they pay the Port of Tillamook Bay a fee or whatever to run their train on the line, and their excursion leaves from Banks, so maybe a little closer to this area. And they are in the process of uh, making a brochure for their new season, and so I don't have any of these, but what I've done is I took this and on the back... I wrote their website and phone number, so if you'd like to look them up or call them and ask them for their brochure when it comes out or check them out on the web, uh, it's on the back here. They are trying to do a little fancier train if you like the club service in the summertime that should be available. They will start April 5th running every other weekend in the spring from Banks all the way over to Rockaway and Garibaldi on the coast. And then in the summertime, they tell me they're going to be running every weekend to the coast from Banks. And then also in the fall, that's a real pretty time to go when the maple leaves turn color. And so if you want to wait till then, that's, that's really a treat, too. I did that this fall. Uh, so I have a few of these. Pick them up if you'd like. And then Paul's book is available over here. Uh, this is in soft cover uh, for $29.95 tonight, 25% uh, off the retail at the store. And then for those of you who are collectors, the book was done in uh, hardcover. This is a limited edition. It's autographed and numbered inside on a special page. And if you're that kind of person, uh, these are $59.95. And I just want to say that the guy I graduated from high school with actually owns the company that published this. So I ran into him at Tillamook County when he was doing the one for Tillamook County. So neat little book here. His name is Brad Finnison. Thank you very much for your attention, and if you'd like to see uh, some of the pictures in the book, there's four photos framed on the table over there. Those pictures are inside the book, and all the pictures in the book are pretty sharp and clear. The ones on the slides weren't quite as clear. That's why they didn't make it into the book. There's a couple pictures of the stage on the Trask River Wagon Toll Road, and there's another shot of the Summit House in the book, too. Thank you very much. I guess I never thought about how much it took to put up those railroad trestles and everything. Yes? Maybe one very important thing I don't think Paul addressed. Why is the title of this book, Punk, Rotten, and Nasty? Yes, do we get an answer to that? There was uh, an acronym for Pacific Railway and Navigation Company. I guess that's what you call it. The first letter, P, R, and N. And the railroad, of course, had so many curves and trestles that were always rotting away. And so, like the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle was a slow, poor, and stingy. I guess it was just a common thing they did back in those days for humor. Uh, survived till today. Our uh, next meeting will be the right here, second Tuesday of the month, which is the 11th. <laughs> Yes, buy a calendar because they're all marked. And if they're wrong, why well, ask us why they're wrong? And we'll try to come up with some reason or other. Um, but they're special tonight, $5. So, And they will, these will be for sale at the museum if you're interested. I appreciate all of you coming, and thank you very much.